This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 47, recorded on December 13th, 2012. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. This Week in Microbiology is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. How are you doing? I'm nice well. to be on again. Welcome back. Hope everything is well with you. Yeah, we're having some rain in San Diego, which is unusual but most welcome, and maybe I'll get to see some mushrooms popping up. I was just going to ask you, will, will the mushrooms come out now? They sure will. They are eager to, they, they don't wait too long when this happens. So I, how soon after the rain will you go look? Oh, three or four days. So on the weekend, maybe, right? Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. Nice. Sounds good. Also joining us today from Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Elio. How's things going today up in beautiful New York City? It's a beautiful day today. It's cold but clear and blue skies, about uh, 7 degrees Celsius here. We're in winter. Well, we were supposed to have, the sky was supposed to clear because there's that famous meteor shower that's supposed to occur tonight, but uh, it doesn't look like it's going to clear, so no meteor viewing at the beach You're not going to see it, huh? No, it's, it's, it hasn't blown out yet. It rained yesterday, and it just hasn't cleared up to see that uh, end-of-the-world meteor shower as we mm. get to the equinox when the Mayans say that the world is going to end. Well, the, uh, speaking of ending, the year is coming to an end very quickly. We're in the last month, and it's amazing. I don't know where it went. Before we start talking about papers, I wanted to ask uh, both of you a, a question, and this has to do with uh, Hurricane Sandy. As you know, a lot of trees fell down uh, during the hurricane. And this morning, as I was driving to work, you know, it was, it was about freezing uh, early in the morning, and I drove past the recycling center where they're piling up all the broken branches and trees and twigs, huge, huge piles. You know, they clear the streets and they put them on this pile. And I've seen this pile grow over the last few weeks. And this morning, it was steaming. There was steam. It was not, not steam. It was just condensed vapor, I guess, coming out of the pile. So I wanted to ask you, what is going on in that pile to make I this? Can tell you, I can tell you the Latin name for it. Yeah. It's called Eremacausis. Can you spell that? E-R-E-M-A-C-U. Yeah. Or C-A-U-S-I-S. <laughs> it's a Latin name for it. Wow. Eremacausis is the Latin name for the phenomenon that makes compost piles so hot that when mm -hmm. they're working properly, you can't put your hand in it because they get burned. Wow. And this is heat gener generated by essentially fermentative processes. Mm -hmm. So we don't think about this in biochemical reactions normally because the reactions are so dilute in di such dilute conditions that the heat generated dissipates in the in the buffer. But if you have it in a circumscribed space, the heat generated is sufficient. They can even catch on fire. I, guess. I think I, I think that's been known to happen. Wow. So. Especially, if, well, what happens with the, the, what catches on fire is the methane that's often generated. So that's maybe what it is. On the mm -hmm. other hand, I'm not so sure because the um, breakdown of uh, lignin is very slow. Obviously, there's some cellulose and other stuff in trees, mm -hmm. and that can be decomposed fairly rapidly. But the bulk is lignin, and lignin is very recalcitrant. It eventually, gets decomposed by fungi. I see. But I'm not so sure that this is. Um, I'm not so sure this is what I, the phenomenon that I, that I mentioned. It may be just simply that they store up the heat or 
something and under the right conditions you just give up enough vapors if the air is cold it looks like steam i see hmm. yeah i was i was wondering if it was some kind of fermentation i think it's just a dew point i think uh the yeah. pile is warmer yeah. and what you saw is a simple dew point because it's probably simple decomposition and fermentation as you said and it's just raised the heat because yeah. our our friends who listen to us and who do fermentation for a living in the big scale systems will tell you that their biggest expense in running large scale fermenters is of course not heating them but cooling them yeah. because right. yeah. because metabolism does generate heat right well i always try and look at the world around me and see what the microbes are doing they're all over they're all over so that's why i passed it. i said i have to ask the uh, my co-host today about this so <laughs> There you go, a little of the real world. Good try, good try. All right, on to our papers. First one is a paper right up Michael's Alley. It's in M-Bio, Horizontal Transfer of Antibiotic Resistance Genes on Abiotic Touch Surfaces, Implications for Public Health. And I must say, Michael, the introduction and parts of the discussion of this paper are frightening. They truly are. I mean, if you don't read anything, just read the opening paragraph of the conclusion where uh, Dr. Keevil and his colleagues write, it's estimated that ten up to 10% of patients admitted to modern hospitals uh, acquire one or more infections, and that proportion rises to 25% in some developing countries. So that's one in four people admitted to hospitals will actually acquire an infection. And, and in fact, that really sets the tone as to why this paper is in MBIO and why it's so important to discuss it. It's about horizontal gene transfer. And over the last few years, we had a TWIM where we actually discussed NDM, the New Delhi metalloprotease that actually confers the metallobeta lactamase uh, that confers uh, antibiotic resistance and many gram negatives and it's really rapidly spread around the globe can and you this spell out can you spell out what NDM stands for uh, it stands for New Delhi and the N is new the D is Delhi yeah. And the M is the metallo beta lactamase. So it's the N this is the new Delhi metallo beta lactamase. Okay. It's a mouthful, but it's it's easier to remember acronym. I have a I'm kind of allergic to acronyms. So I, I too am uh, also allergic to acronyms. And this is a really good paper for the entering student because it begins to reteach some basic principles like conjugation. And uh, determining such simple concepts as the conjugation frequency, which I think is uh, oftentimes forgotten by many modern molecular biologists since we don't do that much conjugation type research any longer. But the uh, conjugation frequency and how conjugation frequency is actually calculated and the methods are really interesting in how you go through it. So I'm going to take you through this paper telling you this this remarkable story. Before you do, I think you made a very good point that in the lab you don't see conjugation going on very often, but in nature it actually happens a great deal, which is the point of this paper. So there's a disconnect between what we do in experiments and what happens in the real world, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, I'll just jump to figure two, where if you just simply look at the title of figure two, it's the comparison of the frequencies of conjugation of donor E. coli or that has a particular um, uh, phenotype and uh, Klebsiella pneumonia that contains um, either a beta lactamase, contains the beta lactamase resistance gene and the NDM or the beta lactamase uh, plasmid. And the way they set up this experiment is they ask a, a simple question. They ask, 
if, if we mix the donor and the recipient, and here's a little digression about how to do conjugation experiments, you have to kill off the donor and the recipient in your ultimate uh, selection when you get the final colony. So um, typically you have 10 times as many donor cells to the recipient cells and the recipients in this case is they're moving the marker genes which contain the antibiotics so you're going to score for transfer of the antibiotics resistance determinant from the donor to the recipient and the recipient doesn't have the antibiotic trait but it has another trait that allows it to grow and this particular trait that the recipient has is its ability to grow in the presence of sodium azide. And any biochemist out there will tell you what's the first thing you put in buffers. And of course, Vincent, it's what? Azide. Azide. Yeah, you put it in buffers so bacteria don't eat your proteins. Yeah, that would, that would be true, yeah. And, and so consequently, uh, if the recipient acquires the plasmid, that has the resistance marker, and in this case, it's, it's beta-lactamase or NDM, the recipient that has acquired the new information, and if it's stably integrated, will be able to grow on a plate containing azide mm -hmm. and the drug of choice. If the recipient does not have the, uh, the gene of choice, it will, of course, not live because the antibiotic is there and it won't be able to grow. And all this is done just so that you can measure conjugation, yes. right? Because so this is obviously the score for the, the guys who made it. Yeah. Yeah. The successful date. And the transfer is by conjugation. Is that what's going on? Conjugation. You're having sex. Garden variety sex. And <laughs> so the DNA goes through the sex pillus. Yeah. And so you have E. coli transferring DNA down its sex pillus into E. coli. So you have Inter, you have intraspecies transfer, which isn't really that remarkable. But when you have Klebsiella, which is not only a different species, but it's also a different genus, it's moving the beta-lactamase or the NDM from it to the E. coli. So now you can begin to understand how antibiotic resistance moves so easily amongst bacteria because bacteria can have sex and have productive sex where the phenotype is transferred hmm. amongst different genera. So this is really pretty uh, interesting. And figure two really goes through this in very elegant detail. They have a donor and they have a suspension and they mix the Klebsiella and they ask the question, how many Klebsiella beta-lactamase genes transferred to the azide-resistant E. coli, and they get a conjugation frequency down in the 10 to the minus 7th range, which is arguing that it's not very efficient. But if you think about the concentration of bacteria that are resident on normal hospital equipment, it's pretty substantial because meant the infectious dose for some of these KPC, Klebsiella pneumonia, carbapenemase resistant strains that have some of these uh, determinants or NDM, so I guess that would be KPNDM, can be pretty uh, substantial in the environment and it only takes one to ten of those to effectively cause an infection in a patient because they're so good at infecting the vulnerable in a hospital. So the first thing that these authors did is they asked a, a very, they're, they're setting up the story is, is conjugation relevant in the dry environment of hospital equipment, whether it be the rail of the patient's bed, whether it be the overbed tray table that you eat your lunch from, or whether it be uh, the IV pole you carry as you walk up and down the hall to reambulate yourself. And what they show in the first figure, and if you look at our modern hospital, a lot of the stuff is, is made out of stainless steel. And what you find is that um, E. coli survives for a long period of time 
on stainless steel. When in, in figure one, you start out with 10 million bacteria and you ask the simple question, how many die each day? And, you know, as you dehydrate, some of the gram negatives die very quickly and E. coli is no exception. And so you drop two logs in 10 days. And so they start with 10 million and in two days you have 100,000. And then over a month, you only drop three to four more logs. And so you can begin to see that way out at 100 days, you still almost have 1,000 E. coli on this solid stainless steel coupon, or you still have at least one Klebsiella pneumonia sitting on this stainless steel coupon. So What's a coupon, by the way? They use the term coupon. I didn't oh. understand it when I read it. What's a coupon here? A, a coupon, coupon is where I click is, to go to the grocery store. <laughs> it, it's literally that metaphor where you clip something out, and a coupon is about the size of the coupon you clip from the grocery store that's oh, made out of the metal. Just a piece of metal. Yeah. It's a piece of metal. Hmm. So you can well imagine you can toss this piece of metal into our standard sterilization oven at 180 degrees C for you know, a week or not a week, uh, three hours and it'll, you know, kill everything on it. You pull it out and then you can inoculate bacteria. And they typically put uh, 10 million bacteria in a 20 microliter aliquot. The other thing that uh, you need to appreciate is what the microbe is suspended in. And they took great pains to suspend the microbe in phosphate buffered saline. Uh, tryptocase soy broth and brain heart infusion agar and the difference you don't mean agar uh, excuse me i mean broth i'm sorry thank you for catching that tryptocase soy broth is um, very different than luria broth tryptocase soy broth uh, has uh, tryptone uh, yeast extract and a phosphate buffer in it as well as glucose so that is effectively going to give the microorganism a nice growth medium. And as you put 20 microliters onto this coupon, it will dry down. And now those proteins will effectively stabilize the drying effect, the dehydration effect that can happen to this. And when you grow the microbe in brain heart infusion broth, brain and heart are very high in lipid content. And so you have a lot more fat. And the reason they work with these three different suspensions, and this, is, this goes to their figure three, where panel A is phosphate buffered saline, uh, panel B is tryptocase soy broth, and panel uh, C is brain heart infusion broth. This then teaches you that what the microbe is in can actually determine how long it will remain viable on these various um, hospital surfaces. So you can make the leap to thinking about what's going on in the hospital. And typically, you think about fugitive emissions uh, just when you sneeze and you get, you know, he hit your monitor. And most of the stuff in our sneeze, unless you have an active uh, cold, is, is mostly water which is very similar to PBS and versus when you have a productive uh, runny nose where there's more, you know, to, to use the impolite term snot, which is more like brain heart fusion broth. But you call it a fugitive emission? A fugitive emission. What a wonderful, I never heard that. That's great. Well, you don't know so where. Why didn't they, I, didn't, I don't quite know why they, they used artificial media when they could have used fugitive emissions or blood. Or something that's in the environment. Why? Why not do the real look at the real situation? It's kind of peculiar. I think there are habits that we have of using laboratory media, but it's, it seems a little bit inappropriate almost. Well, this is, I think, the issue of reproducibility. Everybody's uh, snot is different, right? Pretty much so. <laughs> yeah, but you can make a preparation and use it for, for the life of the experiment. It can be the same preparation. Just start up with a lot of snot. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. You and and you can use saliva. You can exactly. you, know, you can just have people pile, chew on wax. And, I could just see people getting hell for that kind of experiment. <laughs> you know, use Alios uh, snot, and then someone says, "No, it's Alios. This is different from everyone else in the world." You know. Well, you bet. It, 
Well, you <laughs> That's know, why this, they called me snotty. <laughs> this is the fundamental issue of, um, you know, bacteria in the environment and really drives home the importance of the data associated with this paper. They're actually measuring conjugation between a multidrug resistant group like the Klebsiella, and they're asking, can it move amongst a different species? So we're, they're, they're setting us up to think about antibiotic transference on fomites. And a fomite is this inanimate object that healthcare workers or visitors coincidentally touch and exchange data on. So you, you can well imagine... Well, a fomite could be a towel or a cup or anything that's inanimate that, some, that the patient comes in contact with, right? Correct. And, and so it's where the uh, recipient is going to acquire the new knowledge. And if we look at the epidemiology of how... New Delhi, the metallo uh, beta lactamase moved throughout the globe. It's really pretty remarkable at how quickly it spread, and I think the conjugation story is is really part of that. And so the second piece of their story is um, they looked at a continuously active antimicrobial material. And the material that they selected was copper. And solid copper and its alloys containing at least 60% copper are bactericidal to every microorganism that has been checked. You know, everything from E. coli to MRSA to C. diff to spores of C. diff, anything that contains greater than 60% copper will inactivate it. And By the way, if I can I interrupt you with a sure. little memory? Uh, when I set up my lab at the beginning, I was growing E. coli and salmonella in minimal medium, and v not unusually, they wouldn't grow at all. And I traced it back, and other people had the same experience. That if you use regular distilled water, it comes in contact with copper pipes someplace. And if you don't deionize it, E. coli just ain't going to grow. Mm. And this is with very tiny amounts of copper. So it's exquisitely sensitive to that in the absence of other junk like in nutrient broth. So uh, it brings back memories of how I had to fight copper in liquid medium, not only on, on solid surfaces. And if you look at their methods um, for figure five and figure six, where they're looking at how copper uh, destroys DNA, and we'll get to that towards the end, it really speaks volumes to the point Alio brought up because they found if you had a chelator like EDTA, mm -hmm. and EDTA, uh, of course, will chelate the copper ion, it's no longer going to break down the DNA. So they really had a very nice, elegant control. They just used a ladder that they purchased that came in glycerol and EDTA that immediately bound up the copper. And so it was, was pretty neat. So the remainder of the story of the paper is they ask simple questions about conjugation and whether or not conjugation occurs on stainless steel, on a solid sta piece of stainless steel versus a piece of metallic copper. And the copper that they used in the uh, conjugation experiment, uh, I believe, was uh, a copper nickel that contained 89% copper, 10% nickel, and 1% iron. And it's called copper nickel. And, and you know, it's a shiny copper colored stuff that the uh, U.S. dollar, the dollar coin is made out of. So if you get your hands on a new dollar coin, that's effectively copper nickel. And that's what it looks like. So it's, you know, the, the dollar nickel is exquisitely antimicrobial. That, that, by the way, really, that goes back a long ways. It used to be called the uh, oligometallic effect or some fancy name. When I was a student, they talked about how coins are safe, especially copper coins, because bugs are not going to live very long on them. Hmm. That is That's correct. a good thing. It just happened to be a, a coincidence that the U.S. Mint decided on a copper-containing coin. Uh, because, was you know, it really helped. was not done on purpose then. No. no, and in fact, our quarters are actually mostly copper. They That's are, right. and they they and their table give you the list 
of the I think the quarter is nickel silver, uh, which is sixty five percent copper, seventeen percent zinc. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and that's why it looks like it's a silver coin when in There's reality no silver in it. Not a bit of silver in it, right? Not a bit of silver in it. It's just to describe the color. So they did the the take home conclusion of this paper and ask a simple question. Can the plasmid move from the donor to the recipient in the presence of stainless steel? And this is figure two, and the answer was yes. It went between E. coli equally well, you know, from E. coli to E. coli, and it had a conjugation frequency at uh, about, uh, uh, what is it, 3 times 10 to the, the minus 5. So it's a relatively high conjugation frequency on, on solid copper at T0. So it's having sex um, wicked fast. That's amazing to me. It's, uh, it's immediate. Oh, yeah. So you basically, these guys have peli, and as soon as they touch another bacterium, they start pushing DNA through it. Or is the DNA always coming out? Well, you know, conjugation, you have to be competent to (laughs) have that sex. And and so you have to have the right receptor in order to to move it across. And on um, the solid surface, it's... um, you know, if you look at the stainless steel number at, at T0, what you see is that Klebsiella pneumonia moved it to the recipient E. coli pretty damn good. It's amazing. And then they asked the question, did it breed true? Now, this may confuse folks because if you get a colony on a plate, obviously it's just not the product of that one sexual encounter. The colony had to multiply upward. So it's obviously bred true. So then why did they, you know, pick and streak on the next, you know, pick and streak? And and the only thing I can rationally explain is growing on a solid surface often induces damage in the cell. So you may get the F0 generation to come up on the plate, but you know, subsequently that cell may be so damaged and it may not uh, survive, which is why you see a difference between the immediate and then the actual result where they actually look at the, the subsequent event. And when you ask the question, does it move on copper? Well, the, the Klebsiella pneumonia was able to move it at T0, and T0 is effectively, you literally put the, the bacteria on the coupon, you allow it to dry, and then you pull them off. And uh, as you see, it, it was pretty damn fast, even on copper. But at two hours, you have no conjugation left, and that's principally because all the bacteria have have died. And that takes us to, to figure three, where they actually illustrate for us how quickly copper kills hmm. Uh, on solid surfaces, and they take us through, and you you can see it's a concentration-dependent kill across the board. So I'm just going to talk for the sake of time about panel A, where it's phosphate-buffered saline. So up at the top, you have stainless steel, and what you're seeing out at, at two hours where there is some killing of stainless steel is you're probably measuring the dehydration effect, hmm. where the bacteria are dying from dehydration. Whereas in panel B, you really don't see any perceived death from stainless steel because the proteins are protecting the bacteria from the the dehydration. This is especially apparent when you look at the brain heart infusion broth. But then looking at, uh, as you go down these curves and look at the kill curves, and we're just going to go look as the rate goes from... Um, slow to fast, so we're moving from right to left. The first uh, curve is something called Munts metal, which is uh, the lowest concentration of copper. Then you have the silver nickel, which is 65% copper. And then you have good old cartridge brass, which is, as its name implies, it's what bullets, you know, the copper jacketed bullets at 70-30. And then you have um, 
the phosphor bronze, which is 95% copper, 5% uh, silicon, and a little bit of uh, phosphorus. And then the last one is uh, copper nickel, which uh, is 89% uh, copper and uh, the remainder for all intents and purposes is nickel. And so you see how quickly copper kills. And again, it really drives home the, the story that um, a continuously active antimicrobial material like copper can actually snuff out this movement of multi-drug resistance amongst populations in the, the built environment. The remainder of their paper then gets into the subtleties of the wet killing copper versus the dry killing copper. And wet versus dry is again where you're measuring copper ion versus the ability of what Alio was introducing us to is the oligo sensitivity of, of copper coins or coins and how they kill. And that's specifically explained in their supplemental f figure where exposure to dry copper inhibits respiration. And they, they teach you how to measure respiration. And I encourage you to look at the supplemental figure because it's, it's really pretty neat in that they have both uh, cartridge brass and pure metallic copper. And in panels D and C, you see no respiration of the bacteria on these copper surfaces, while on stainless steel, you see actively respiring cells uh, go into town. And this, again, drives home the fact that what copper, the metallic copper is doing is effectively scrounging uh, electrons. And it's this scrounging of electrons that effectively result in the rapid death of the microorganism because you effectively are collapsing the, the membrane potential. And it's all about the membrane potential. Michael, since you were very visual here for a while, you know, listeners don't, may not have the paper in front of them, but uh, the way they measure respiration is on a single cell level using a dye called tetrazoleum, which turns red upon reduction, right? So you can see, you can look at the respiration in terms of percent cells which are respiring and not respiring under the microscope. And it's, it's really pretty dramatic because on the copper coupon, there's no red light. And on the stainless steel coupon, there's plenty of red light. And they have a control on the other side in, in panels A, C, and E. They use um, Cyto9, which is green. So you can literally count the number, and that's how you're able to determine the percentage. And the interesting thing about all of this is you have to ask yourself the question, how does copper do all these remarkable things, and it goes back to uh, a f the Fenton reaction that we all learned in freshman chemistry, where iron 2 or copper 1 donate or accept free electrons during uh, the process of metabolism, and since bacteria do all their metabolism inside their cell, uh, you have the ability to have these hydroxyl ions that are that are generated and the net consequence is you get a cycling of copper one and copper two uh, and it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy that this copper cycles back and forth very quickly and you're generating a lot of free radicals that then results in the cleavage of uh, DNA which are their final uh, sets of figures in figure five and in figure six, where they actually measure the breakage of DNA as a, a consequence of copper. And it, it drives home the theme as to conjugation, because not only does co will copper prevent the conjugation that they've shown, but in transformation, 
And this occurs quite often in, in gram positives as well as gram negatives, where you'll have the lysis of the bacterium and the bacterium will spill its gut. So the DNA is just sitting out there on the surface. And remember, bacteria have a means to bring in DNA. That's, of course, the first major experiment that we all learned about uh, that DNA was the molecule of life uh, with the rough pneumococci and the smooth pneumococci. Um, you, they then go in figure six and they show how copper is able to break DNA and they just have a really simple way of illustrating this with an agarose gel and they go from having a distinct banding pattern to having a gigantic schmear that goes into nothingness as time progresses and they're able to measure how uh, the killing is dependent upon copper and time is, is essential. And of course, temperature is important because as we well know, the DNA is of course a temperature active molecule. And so the warmer it is, the more active the copper can uh, get in line with the DNA in concert with the free radical generation and, of course, cleave and break the DNA down. And this group, uh, Warrens and Kievel, and I just lost the title page. Highmore. Uh, Highmore. Highmore have actually done this in an exquisite set of papers that were in AEM where they looked at this in enterococci and staphylococci and E. coli. So I think, you know, looking at this from truly translational medicine, what they have shown is that this is a good way of controlling the spread of DNA within the environment if you can just short circuit uh, the ability to transfer this material. Michael, how much does conjugation on the built environment contribute to uh, the spread of antibiotic resistance? Do we have any sense of that versus within the patient, for example? I don't think we have a good sense of it um, in the sense that we do know that the built environment does contribute to the rate of hospital-associated infections. Mm. Uh, and, it's, and the resistance. And resistance. And so I guess it's now that they have demonstrated this, we can probably begin to do a survey of copper in the built environment and ask the question about antibiotic frequency in that population. Michael, if you were designing a hospital, would you put copper surfaces or whatever you can? Or is that premature? Is, are we at that point yet? We're at that point. Um, we know that copper, um, I uh, have a paper in the process of being finally uh, finishing its peer review process that has uh, shown that uh, limited and strategic placement of this material can control the rate at which HAIs are acquired. And I think this group has demonstrated that it can control the spread of antibiotic resistance markers, at least from conjugation and maybe potentially transformation. And it's real infection in the hospital is a stochastic process because healthcare is still individualized. Not everybody is treated the same. Uh, one of the comments. Uh, that was made in our review was they asked me, did I track how often the healthcare team moved in and out of the patient's room? And of course, if you think about it, oh that's a really hard thing to do in a multi-center trial. And how do you begin to analyze that data? Since I was trained to do binary experiments that ask yes or no questions, which is why I think this paper is a good primer for the entering graduate student because it begins to teach them about conjugation, something that was forgotten, but it's so important in this era of emerging antibiotic resistance to really understand this frequency pattern. And now 
we're getting much better with our our uh, epidemiological tracking because we have such tremendous molecular tools. We can fingerprint these these microbes with MLST, or we can even sequence them. But you know, the the scary thing is that Stephanie Dancer of the United Kingdom uh, postulates that uh, to acquire an infection in the hospital typically takes a dose of one pathogen, whether it be MRSA, whether it be VRE, whether it be C. diff. VRE. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci. VRE. VRE. And And, uh, how about C. difficile? Same thing. C. difficile and Clostridium difficile is a really challenging organism to cultivate from the environment uh, because you're effectively trying to find spores and you need to transport them back to the lab uh, in pre-reduced medium uh, in an anaerobic uh, chamber so that when the spore germinates... See, why, why do you have to do that with spores? Are spores sensitive to oxygen? Typically, the way you swab in the environment is you wet them. And oh, I see. So they could our, germinate. From our discussion of last time, we know right. what triggers germination. Right. Moisture and is one thing. Moisture is the trigger. And if there's oxygen present, sure. Sure. you're dead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, they, maybe they can figure out sampling techniques which don't involve water. They just involve scraping or something. Anyhow. Uh, that's a side point, but uh, Michael, I think this is a really beautiful presentation you made because this is maybe a low-tech, relatively low-tech solution to a gigantic problem, or at least a partial solution. I don't know if copper is that much more expensive to install. Maybe it is, but uh, it, the cost seems to is probably within reason, and this could revolutionize or might revolutionize the whole problem of hospital acquired infection. So. I, I I applaud this. It's good stuff. Well, if you look at the Center for Medicare Services data from, and their most recent data, I think, is from 2004, they estimate that a hospital-associated infection costs, on average, $43,000 and right. adds 19 days to your stay in the hospital. That's so misery. Yeah. You're in the hospital because you're sick, you're going to get sicker. I mean, that is... Really a horrible thing. The last sentence of this paper, the evolution of potentially untreatable infectious diseases will eventually and inevitably affect us all. Yeah. It's pretty serious. It's got cheerful thoughts for the for the season. Really, really nice. Yeah. Michael, thank you. That was great. You're welcome. It was a fun one to do uh, because I think anytime you can it, it took me back to my roots of doing the conjugation lab with uh, the undergraduates when I was a TA at Indiana. Well, we're, we're, and ha- we're happy to be able to do that for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next paper is Applied in Environmental Microbiology. It's called Reversing Bacterial Resistance to Antibiotics by Phage-Mediated Delivery of Dominant Sensitive Genes. So we have a little theme here today. We sure do. We sure do. This is more of the same, only uh, it has a different flavor. Same uh, category of phenomena being studied, again, having to do with living on the surface of hospital hospital surfaces. Right. So hospital surfaces and antibiotic resistance, right? Right. So we are, we are still there. So uh, I'm going to present this paper, I guess. Yes, please, Elliot. And the title of the paper is... Reversing Bacterial Resistance to Antibiotics by Phage-Mediated Delivery of Dominant Sensitive Genes. It's by a group in Tel Aviv, led by the, the senior author is Udi Kimron. I don't know any of these people, but it's, this is an exercise in extraordinary cleverness. This is not your regular sort of let's go after a phenomenon paper. This is one that requires... I would say leaps of faith and leaps of technical and genetic savvy. So the title, Reversing Bacterial Resistance to Antibiotics. Think what that means. It means that if you could take bacteria which are resistant to antibiotics and talk them out of it, and persuade them to become sensitive, you'd solve the problem. Not bad. 
How do you do that? We're going to go into that in a minute. It says by phage mediated, phage mediated. So we already know how they're going to try. They're going to try to do this by phage mediated delivery of dominant sensitive genes. Now here's the story. Um, and by the way, before I do that, let me tell you that in, in the paper they say our overall goal in the study is to provide a proof of principle for a genetic system that is able to restore drug sensitivity to drug-resistant pathogens residing on hospital surfaces. Now, if you have copper there, you may not need any of this, right? That's, That's so true. Let's, <laughs> this may be, uh, the first paper may be, may be obviating the second one, but this is an exercise in how to think as much as it is in translation or medicine or public health. So it's well worth going into. It was published in um, AEM, which is uh, Applied in, in the Environmental Microbiology. And this came out in uh, what year? February of this year. All right. So it all starts with a finding by Joshua Lederberg, the discoverer of bacterial conjugation in 1951. It's not long after he discovered it. I think he discovered transformation, uh, conjugation in 1946, I think is when they published the paper. He was only 28 years old. Anyhow, he found in this 1951 paper that if you look at heterozygous diploids, that's the word that we used then. Today we would call him a bacterium that carries a plasmid. <laughs> <laughs> a bacterium that carries a plasmid, there is a sensitive gene on one, let's say on the chromosome, or in a resistance gene on the plasmid, or vice versa. That's making a difference. Guess who wins? The <laughs> sensitive gene. Now, this is kind of surprising, because you think, gee, what difference does it make if there's a resistance gene there, if there's a sensitive gene there? Resistance is resistance, right? So you think, take streptomycin, which is the drug that he studied. If you have a streptomycin in the medium, and you have those two genes, the resistance gene is going to dominate and take over, right? This would be logical. Not so. Turns out that in this case, and in some other cases, the sensitive gene is dominant. And I guess to this date, I'm not so sure we know how this works. Mike, are you up on the latest on the mechanism of this? Because I can say something about the, what was thought about this in the old days. I would go with the old days because okay. I don't know. Okay. Now let's assume that not much has happened in the last uh, 40 years. I'm not sure. Maybe it has, but let's presume that it hasn't. So in the old days, you would say that what happens is the resistant uh, part of the of the element, which in this case is ribosomes, because streptomycin is a drug that inhibits protein synthesis by hitting the ribosomes. So you have now resistant ribosomes, and they should be able to go ahead. But the sensitive ribosomes muck up the cell. In other words, having sensitivity does not just stop protein synthesis. It does other things to the cell. And what it is to this date, I really don't know. I, whether it's active today, we may think about, I think, activating a toxin antitoxin system, which would work fine in this case. Whatever right. it is, whatever it is, let's presume we, we, we know and, and go on. Whatever it is, sensitivity is epistatic. Now, Michael, that's a term you haven't heard since graduate school, right? No, epistatic actually, I means, heard it last week from uh, ah. the, the former head of, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who asked uh, an individual what that meant. <laughs> what does it mean, Elio? Well, it means that one gene is, has dibs over the other. Yeah. One is dominant over the other. It's another word for dominant? No, it's, 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 it's not dominant. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is. It's epistatic. It means one is dominant over the other. Yeah. <laughs> but genetics is like their own language, and so here it is. Anyhow, never mind that. <laughs> so now they say, how are we going to do that? How are we going to render a, a resistant bacterium sensitive? By swapping the genes. By swapping the gene of resistance for the gene of sensitivity. Well, the fact is that it's, you don't have to actually do any swapping. All you have to do is to introduce the gene for sensitivity. The gene for resistance isn't going to do anything, right? So it's a great situation. So they looked at mutations, and they found the mutations of streptomycin in, in, um, in E. coli. And they got all kinds, and the resistance typically uh, will uh, work at the level of increasing the MIC, that's the minimum inhibitory concentration, by about a hundredfold. So it will go from uh, typically the uh, regular sensitive E. coli they start with is sensitive to about one and a half micrograms per ml. 
the resistance will be resistant to about 200 to 100 to 200 micrograms. Okay, so they know that they have such resistant mutants, and now they want to reduce the problem by introducing the sensitive gene. So they start out by doing this with plasmids, which is a logical thing to do, and plasmids indeed increase the uh, resistance by a considerable fold. I forgot how much it is, but it's quite a bit. So um, they do that. Imagine now using this on a surface. They are thinking the same way the people in the first paper think, that the, the surfaces in a hospital environment are highly contaminated and should be decontaminated. So they say, how are we going to do this? Are we going to spray a plasmid all over the place? Or that doesn't work because a plasmid by itself isn't going to get incorporated. So you'd have to spray, give, a, do a conjugation experiment that is add to the surface a donor bacterium which can carry the plasmid into a recipient. Well, you don't want to do that. You certainly don't want to spread another E. coli or another bug into the environment which is already contaminated. And uh, there's lots of reasons why this is not such a great idea. So they thought and thought and said, why not, instead of using a plasmid, use a phage? Now, think about it. A phage is something you can spray on a surface. And it doesn't have to do anything. It just has to wait for the bacterium to come and pick it up. Right? So it's not the situation with conjugation where you need two cells, two kinds of cells that can mate with each other. Here you just need to add the phage. And this leads us vaguely, generally, into the subject of what can you do with phages in people. The whole subject of phage therapy, we talked about this, didn't we, once? We did. Yeah, way, way and, and we have this company based out of uh, Maryland called Intralytics that makes uh, phage that they actually incorporate into cold cuts. It's the FDA-licensed phage product to control listeria, and they're also developing one to control salmonella and E. coli in processed meats and, and ground beef. So it's not too far-fetched to think about spraying phage within a hospital environment because the FDA is already, nest, already letting them do it and food that we consume. That's yeah. right. That's twim right. twim so, number six. We talked about yeah. antibacterial yeah. therapy with phage. Yep. And we'll we'll be talking about it again because it's a recurrent. It's a topic. Phage therapy has has this wave function. It comes and goes. I mean, since Derell and Tour discovered phages in 1910, 1920, uh, phage therapy is come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. It seems to be a little bit on the ascendancy now. In Eastern Europe, it has been used considerably, especially in Bulgaria, and I believe in Estonia, and, and I think also in Russia. So we'll be hearing more about it. But anyhow, that is not the subject of this paper. It's not phage therapy. It's not injecting phages into people. It's simply spraying it on surfaces. And by the way, they have one really neat trick. When you do something like this and you want to figure out if you have, in fact, succeeded, have you, in fact, introduced the gene you want, what you do is you have a marker gene that goes along with it, okay? Typically, a resistance gene. But what resistance are you going to use? Because if you're going to use a gene for resistance to streptomycin, you're doing exactly what you shouldn't be doing. Namely, you're adding genes to resistance into the environment. So they figured that there is a compound namely potassium telluride, a salt, which is quite toxic to bacteria. It's been known that since, the, I think, Alexander Fleming, and it's actually been used in syphilis therapy. I don't know, obviously unsuccessfully, but anyhow. But the beauty of telluride is that if you become resist, the gene for telluride resistance is very small, and it is not related to resistance to anything else. So becoming resistant to telluride is something you can do environmentally because it's of no effect. You're not using that for selection. You're not going to come up. Telluride is not found in the environment. It's a very rare metal. And so it's, it's okay to do that. It's very clever to come up with something like that. And they were lucky that they did. Do they turn black? Yeah. Yeah, the bacteria growing on telluride, that's right. They make intracellular crystals of black telluride. And um, by the way, the reason telluride is toxic, this is a total digression, folks. Don't listen if you don't want to. The uh, telluride is toxic because it substitutes for sulfur. It's in the same chemical group as sulfur. So the cells take up telluride, put it in with sulfur, and this way they muck up the cellular metabolism completely. 
So uh, and it's quite rare. It's 75th in abundance on Earth crust. Uh, and yet bacteria and some eukaryotes carry genes which are resistant to telluride. So telluride is a great substance to use for uh, detecting that you have been successful. So anyhow, so they do this. So they now play around with the phage, and they found that the phage they use does not increase resistance. So mind you, they take a phage that has the sensitivity gene, they add it to bacteria which are resistant, and now they ask, does the sensitivity go up? And the answer is not by much, maybe <laughs> fourfold. Okay, not by much. So far, so at this point, I'd quit. They didn't. They say, hey, if one gene is good, two genes are better. So let's put two genes, two copies of the same gene into the phage. And by the way, the phage, the, since uh, there's enough room in the phage to do this, so it's no problem. So now they get it down, they get the sensitivity up considerably. Now it's okay. It's, it's, it's fine. And now they have what they want. They have transferred sensitivity to a resistant bacterium by using a phage that transferred the sensitivity genes. Now, pretty good so far, right? So now the question is, that's good for the genes they looked at, namely streptomycin resistance. How often is this true that sensitivity is dominant over resistance? Okay, Because obviously, if this is a one-of-a-kind phenomenon, only true for streptomycin, we're not going to get very far. So the answer is, well, it works for nalidic acid, an inhibitor of gyrase, and they think that it will work for a whole lot of other antibiotics. And I don't know the answer because obviously something is known about this and I don't know it. But certainly we have a lot of, oh, trimethoprim resistance and stuff like that. So it's possible that the situation which we have here of um, sensitivity being dominant to resistance can be used for a lot of other antibiotics. And in terms of this being of practical use, it matters a great deal because streptomycin is not used. In practice, nalidixic acid probably isn't used that much. So it, it really depends. Is this a phenomenon that is characteristic of resistance and sensitivity for a lot of other antibiotics? And if it were, it may work. Now, in truth, when you look at this whole thing, Killing the bacteria is a hell of a lot better than keeping them, than making them sensitive. But it's a very clever, this, I think, as I say, it's an exercise in exquisite elegance. How's that? Well, Michael, if you put copper everywhere, it would probably kill the phages, right? You might. It doesn't, it does indeed kill eukaryotic viruses. I don't know whether or not mm. Bill has tried to inactivate phage, but. You know, it's it's an issue of you have to marshal your resources. And, it, you know, infection control is a, a systems-based engineering system. You put copper on surfaces closest to the patient, and then you may want to put the phage in the mop water to take out the uh, microorganisms, uh, make the microorganisms that are on the floor hmm. sensitive to uh, the antibiotics. Yeah, I see, yeah, right. How about for these um, New Delhi metallo beta lactamases, the target, would the target of that be um, a dominant res a sensitivity, you think? Well, Maybe it's not. a pla it's a plasmid. Yeah. And at the quen and you know, a lot of these microbes are building in building these mega plasmids. Because some of these plasmids can be 100 kilobases, you know, almost like the sex plasmid. Yeah. You know, they become huge. And uh, yeah, but Wait, that's not the point. The point is, will resistance become, uh, will dom sensitivity become dominant to resistance? Right. I don't think it would be. I mean, I, we're, 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 however, wherever it comes, whatever the origin of the genes is, I don't think that you can assume in the case of beta-lactams that affect cell wall synthesis, that it's the same story as with streptomycin. Right. No. I really doubt. Yeah. yeah. I doubt. Which uh, may be a problem with this yeah, approach. Limited. Yeah. At best, it would be a limited Yeah, scope. yeah. Nonetheless, an interesting exercise, as you say. Yeah. By the way, I looked up epistatic, a gene whose phenotype, so epistasis is a phenomenon where expression of one gene depends on the presence of one or more modifiers. A gene whose phenotype... What it means? Yeah, a gene whose yeah, phenotype wrong, is expressed is called epistatic, while one whose phenotype is altered or suppressed is called hypostatic. 
Epistasis oh, can be contrasted with dominance, which is an interaction between alleles at the same gene locus. Okay. I'm close, but not quite. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. All right. Take a, take a chance with big words. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, anything else, Michael? Any other thoughts before we close here? No, I think we, we again, uh, had two dissimilar papers that we managed to tie up into a neat Christmas package. It is a nice package here. I actually have a couple of emails I'd like to read before we finish. Uh, one is from Maureen, who writes, I love all your series, TWIM, TWIV, and TWIP, and learn immensely from them. I am a clinical research nurse and work at NIH in the NIAID unit that houses the KPCR patients that you may have recently read about. That's what you were just talking about, Michael. Klebsiella mm-hmm. pneumonia. What's the C- Carbapenemase. Resistance. The carbapenemase. And mm. she sent us an article in, in um, science called Tracking a Hospital Outbreak of Carbapenem-Resistant Klebsiella Pneumonia with Whole Genome Sequencing. That's the NIH story. That's right. And she says, I'd like to hear a discussion of this isolate as you educate everyone so thoroughly. Our hospital has worked diligently to track and eliminate this organism, and we've just about succeeded, but I'd still like to be better informed. So um, what can you tell us about this, Michael? Was it, it was an outbreak at this? Uh... There was an outbreak in the adolescent ward at the NIH, mm-hmm. and I believe it was an oncology unit. And um, they had an outbreak, and they closed the unit and remodeled it, and it came back. And the thought is that what we learn today is we see how quickly conjugation takes place in the environment within the, the time it takes from you to swab off of a coupon. It, it's already done. And I think what we've learned from today's story confirms what the NIH saw is that this, um, this strain returned very quickly to the NIH. And this made the New York Times the New York Times talked about uh, they had closed the unit and then it came back. And so even though when you took all the people out and you swabbed the decks and literally did a major renovation, it came back. And the likelihood is it comes back with the staff. And the staff, you know, the staff dropped. Mean, meaning the people who work there. <laughs> people who work there. Not the bacterium. <laughs> well, no, not the bacterium. But it comes back. And it could could be as something as simply as, you know, the gurneys that are used to transport the patients or the transporters or the physicians, the physician's ties. Um, you know, anything can, and we've seen how fast. Mustache, the mustache. I'm suspicious of mustaches. I have one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the mustaches. And, um, you know, it's it's really remarkable. And I think that's why. Uh, the Kievel paper really shows how fast it happens. Hmm. So they say they um, they built a wall to isolate patients, gassed rooms with disinfectant, ripped out plumbing, and they used rectal swabs to test every patient of, in the 234-bed hospital, yet still for six months, the KPC spread killed uh, 11 patients, six from bloodstream infections. Oh. Wow. So these are, Michael, these KPC arc strains um, picked up the plasmids, the resistance plasmids somewhere, right? Right. And they, once they have it, they have it. And it spreads and within a facility and then it can transfer it to other bacteria as well, right? On the surfaces from the patient and you're then at risk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, looking at Stephanie Dancer's work and Chris Griffith's work, from the United Kingdom, they make the argument that it only takes one of these uh, aggressive pathogens. And we've done enough episodes this past year on looking at Shigella and looking at some of these uh, other cases about how few bacteria actually cause, in the case of the Shigella, the food poisoning or the E. coli 0157. Traditionally, The way I was taught, it took 100,000 E. coli to give you diarrhea, but we now know that with 0157, that number is down in only the the 10 to 20 organisms to cause the hemorrhagic form of the diarrhea. So numbers do matter. What's the origin of of the Klebsiella? Is it it in your gut normally? 
Yeah. And so, throat, it, so when you go throat. throat, and so when it's got these resistance genes, if you're in a hospital and you're compromised, then you get in trouble when these start to grow in you. Is that the idea? And they're and they're locally invasive. They're, I see. They're locally they they invade. And the other thing is with Klebsiella is any student of microbiology who ever got it as an unknown in their undergrad class knows that it makes copious amounts of capsule. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually protects them in the environment. And, you know, what's the one of the first things, the requirements for conjugation is that you, the, the male becomes sticky so that the recipient or female sticks to them so that the conjugal bridge doesn't break. Wow. So once it's in your hospital, you have to fire everybody. No, you you just have to, you know, aggressively prosecute hand hygiene mm -hmm. and the other systems-based approaches that hospitals use. Hospitals require that they clean each room once each day. This is typical for the United States. Uh, and oftentimes in the U.S., after we clean with soap and water, many places apply a topical disinfectant that's based on a quaternary ammonia compound that may or may not have alcohol in it, or some places use, you know, a dilution of bleach. Right. And so disinfect cleaning followed by disinfection. You remove the soil with an abrasive, and there's a whole emerging literature on uh, microfiber cloths and how often you can reuse them. And it's it's real. There's a science unto itself in terms of cleaning. Uh, Phil Carling from Harvard has published extensively on uh, cleaning of hospitals. And to give you a scary statistic, United States spends $10 billion cleaning hospital rooms each year. Uh, and uh, Carling's data report that between 32% and 50% of the objects are, are only effectively cleaned. Wow. So does that say then we have to spend $20 billion a year cleaning? And we, we well know, listening to the fiscal cliff talk, that Medicare and Medicaid can't afford any more cost increases. Wow. That's pretty sobering. I think we ought to do an episode with one of these cleaning people and have them tell us the whole story. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. Maybe yeah. You, can, you can recommend people. Yeah. Well, Maureen, you... Uh, got actually relevant two papers today relevant to this question because they were both dealing with the same issue she sent a link also to a really nice washington post article on the outbreak as well as the science uh, paper so we'll put those in uh, i have a, i have an email here uh, from jim who writes thank you very much from the for the informative and often imaginative discussions that take place in twim it's a real pleasure to listen to such a quality fun easily accessible and free source of microbial material I'm sure you're often thanked for taking the effort to put it out there, but I wanted to add my voice. As a cell and molecular biology student, it offers some wonderful connections and points of interest to my education. My question relates to a recently published book by Trudy Wassenaar that I have been reading titled Bacteria, the Benign, the Bad, and the Beautiful. Has anyone read this book, and if so, what are their thoughts on it? I would recommend it to those with a broad interest or who need an introduction like students such as myself. It offers an incredibly interesting and diverse description of bacteria and is easy to understand. I actually picked it up because it was recommended by the Google Plus microbiology account. Mm. Anybody know Gosh, this book? I haven't read it, but I must say it's very timely. I mean, it's amazing how in this day and age, the bulk of people, the majority of people think bugs are germs. They do bad things. Right. That's it. That's, right. that's the prevailing view, I would say, 90% of the people know that i hope the kids in school learn otherwise right. no pickles for them no pickles <laughs> no mushrooms right um uh, i mean the, the no bread no bread oh the french we'd lose france of course yeah, well, really. we lose life yeah there's no life on earth possible without microbes yep yes and finally, our last one's from Steve, who has done a transcription for us of twim number six. So he listened to the file, to the audio, and he made a uh, transcript, which is now on the website. So uh, you can read it if you'd like. And Jim Jim has a cool description of how he does that. So we thank him. He's also done a bunch of them for TWIV. 
uh, as cool. well. It's very cool. Thank you, Steve. And that will do it for Twim 47. You can find us, as usual, on iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash twim. We love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter can be found at Small Things Considered. Thanks for joining us today, Elio. Oh, my pleasure. Wonderful stories. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, Vincent. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Many thanks to ASM for supporting TWIM, Chris Kandayan, and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Thanks for listening. Magnificent. 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 Many, many thanks. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Thank you.